All right, welcome back to Cracks in Postmodernity. We have a very special guest, Glenn Belverio, who amongst many, many different things he's done, he had a famous public access show in the 1990s, originally called Bren the Brenda and Glenda show, then turned Glenda and Friends. Um, it was a drag activist TV show, addressed a number of different social issues, had many guest stars on. Um, most listeners probably are familiar with the episode of Glenda and Camille Do Downtown featuring Camille Paglia. So Glenn, we're very excited to have you on. Thanks for coming. Thanks for inviting me. So first off, I wanna hear a little bit about the background of your show. Tell me what inspired it, how did you get it started? Just all the, the basic info. Oh, well, I'll try to do a condensed version. So um, I moved to New York in 1987 uh, when I was 21. And uh, in 1988, I joined ACT UP, uh, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash mm -hmm. Power. And I um, was an AIDS activist for a few years and I was getting arrested doing civil disobedience and going to protest. And that was really my way of participating in the gay community because I felt like the whole party atmosphere of, of, the, of the gay community was not enough for me, especially that was the height of the AIDS crisis. And I just couldn't be that kind of frivolous gay man that just partied and wasn't politically active. Um, and then at the same time, my friend Tracy Morgan, who was in ACT UP, she started, she felt that there, there, was a, there was a focus on AIDS and a lot of it was on gay men with AIDS. And she wanted to start a group that was about women and, and abortion rights. So she started this group called WAM, Women's Health Action and Mobilization. Um, and I was one of the first male members of that. And we did clinic defense. We defended abortion clinics and we got arrested doing that. And then um, I got involved with public access around 1989 with this, with some video activists that I knew from ACT UP. Um, but we did this show that was very East Village, very downtown. Like we interviewed Lip Sinka, the drag performer and the Del Rubio triplets. And then in 1990, I met Duncan Elliott at Wigstock and we did a show, actually this is still 1989. And we did an episode of this, cable show that I was on called Talk to Go about Wigstock. And um, there was this famous uh, incident where some people from ACT UP who were, who were in drag were bashed in the middle of Tompkins Square, gay bashed mm -hmm. that Wigstock. And Lady Bunny kind of made, like kind of blew it off and made a joke about it. She said, oh, when you boys dress up like that, when you girls dress up like that, those boys can't keep their hands off you. <laughs> And it, so we, there were a lot of ACT UP people there that day. And we um, were, you know, we started a big protest and we were sitting down in the middle of Avenue A and blocking traffic. And that's when Duncan and I got the idea to do a drag queen TV show that was political so that we could bring politics to apolitical gay men and, and other people, whoever, you know, would happen to be watching on public access. So we developed this uh, strategy called drag activism, which was not about doing drag in nightclubs and safe, you know, what they call safe spaces, but taking it out into the streets and sort of confronting people with it and, and engaging people in it and using the, the satire and the humor of drag to um, spotlight political issues. Mm -hmm. um, and the show took off, you know, it was like, in those days, you know, it was pre-internet. Um, it was a lot of people watched public access so we became kind of local celebrities. And then it, after a few months, we were being invited by like to do show videos and, and do a video. We did a video series in Hall Walls in, in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. um, so we became known as like the drag activists of like public access and the, the gay, you know, the film festival world. And then in 1990, around 92, 93, um, Duncan, who played Brenda Sexual on the show, he decided to move down south and pursue a career in landscape architecture. Hmm, so I changed, yeah. So I changed the name of the show to Glenda and Friends and my first guest co-host. I had done a show with Joan Jet Black, who I'm sure you've heard about. She's this amazing black drag queen um, from Chicago who ran for president in 1992. And she was, it was still the Brenda Glenda show, but Dun Brenda had the flu. So my, you know, s substitute for Brenda was Joan Jet Black. Okay. And then, 
that's when I got the idea of like, it would be fun to have different co-hosts um, and, you know, work sort of beyond the world of Brenda Sexual. And then Bruce LaBruce was the first official co-host on Glenn Den Friends. And that was the year, that was a, but around the time that I was now friends with Camille Paglia. I met her in 1992. And then we did a video together, which is probably the most famous video I've done, Glenn Den Camille do downtown. So, and it's worth noting that um, you said that your video collection was digitized in 2020, very recently. Yes. Which contributed to a kind of rediscovery of your work, right? Actually, it was digitized in 2019 and 2020 yeah. is when they launched it. Okay. And um, yeah, there has been this, uh, it sort of energized me to start like, cause for years the tapes were just like lying around and languishing mm -hmm. and I didn't care about it. And I was doing other things with my life. And then I was asked to be, to show Glendon Camille do downtown in an exhibition in Birmingham, uh, not Birmingham, Nottingham, England okay. in 2018. And that's when Video Data Bank was like, we want to digitize all of your work. Um, and then I became kind of aggressive in promoting it on Instagram. And mm -hmm. it seems like I, a new audience has discovered me. A lot of young people, which is super. Yeah, and it seems to be running along um, a, re a parallel with, I guess, the rediscovery of Palio's work, because I, I think I sent you, I wrote the article for American Conservative about how a lot of people close to my age, Gen Z, are getting into her work as well. Um, and, it's, and it's interesting considering she hasn't been very public the last couple of years. But, you know, I think both of the things that, that you guys say, it's speaking to the younger generation really resonates with, I don't know, there's, there's a sense that there's something missing um, or an idea is a kind of vacuum that what you guys are saying fills. And I think, so the, the, your, the Glenda and Camille do downtown was, even though it wasn't available through video until 2020, it was, the transcript was printed in Vamps and Tramps, I believe. That was yes. Before. And that came out in uh, 1994. 94. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and it was during that time when it was playing at film festivals all yeah. over the world from Sundance to Sarajevo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for those who don't know, basically to summarize, you guys walk around downtown Manhattan. It's mostly the village, right? Uh, yeah, it's mostly it's the, mostly the the West Village. Yeah, Greenwich Village and West Village. Yeah, and you get into some confrontations with some. I guess they're what they're anti-porn protesters. The, so. the WAP, well, they were called WAP, uh, <laughs> W-A-P, uh, Women Against Pornography, and they were notorious in the West Village in those days. They would set up the stand in front. It was a bookstore then. I think it was before it was Barnes and Noble, but it was this big bookstore on the corner of West 8th Street and 6th Avenue. Okay. Now I think it's, okay. wow. it's yeah. like a, an abandoned building. You know, they couldn't, I think there was like a juice place in there for a while. Yeah. And, but so they would, and they were super aggressive, like not just male hating, but just really misanthropic and, mm -hmm. um, and they would hold up, you know, images of like uh, really extreme, like S and M pornography, like women with like electrical nipple, like being tortured with like electrified nipple clamps. And then, of course, the famous Hustler magazine cover of the woman going into a meat grinder, which is depicted in the People versus Larry Flint. And what they failed to grasp with that that was an ironic image that Larry Flint had created and they were yeah. taking it at face value like look they're putting women in meat grinders and so they weren't too bright and they were like left of Andrea Dworkin you know mm -hmm. and um so Camille of course is famous for being a pro pro-sex pro-porn feminist and it wasn't staged you know we, most of my videos were quite spontaneous in this kind of like early Warholian way where we just like mm -hmm. turn on the camera. We had a structure of what we wanted to do, yeah. but there was no script, you know, it was very yeah, yes. like free documentary style. So we just ran into them by accident. So it was unbelievable that we ran into them considering Camille's, you know, that that was one of her big like top five views that she was famous for in those days was that she was a feminist who was pro pornography. Um, so we have a confrontation with them and uh, it's, you know, it's probably the most famous scene in my most famous video. Um, and yeah. So how can you just tell us how did that, um, 
how did the idea for that even come to be? Like, how did you decide to do that with her? Well, it was, so when I was in, I, I should really go back to like how I became aware of her. So in, I was in ACT UP from like 1988 to like through 1991, but by 1991, we were becoming really tired of the, um, the doctrine of ACT UP and just the dogma, you know, and the, they would let people like people would show up to be on the agenda like they would have speakers from other groups mm -hmm. and it became less and less about aids and more about all these other issues like political prisoners and and censorship and, and it was really eroding you know our mission to to fight aids so there was this group called WAC. i know it's almost like wap WAC. and it's also uh, ironic when you consider the cardi b song WAP I, yes i know for them uh, yes we we prophesized it 30 yes. years earlier but so there was this group of bourgeois women artists, kind of like this Barbara Kruger, Lori Anderson group called WAC Women's Action Coalition. And their whole mission was that women weren't being, you know, women artists weren't being shown as much as male artists. And that's fine and dandy, but it had nothing to do with AIDS. So they showed up, at, they got, they got, you know, they, they talked their way onto the agenda at ACT UP and this woman got up and she was like, you know, we're here today to tell you that we're organizing a protest against this anti-feminist writer, Camille Paglia. You know, they none of them knew how to pronounce her name. And, you know, she has this new book out that's basically like Mein Kampf. It's called Sexual Persona. <laughs> and we're protesting, you know, against her, you know, against a bookstore that's selling it. I, I don't even remember the event. Yeah. And I was sitting there with my friend Emily. And, uh, and we were kind of like the punks of ACT UP at that point. And we were sort of like feeling we wanted to go against the grain. And I was like, is this where we're, we're at now? We're, we're censoring books. Like, is this where the left is going? Like yeah. we're banning books. And I had heard of Camille, but I didn't know that much about her. And that just made me more like, I wanted to know about her. Mm -hmm. I wanted to read Sexual Persona. And it was around that time that she, it was, you couldn't even turn on the television without seeing Camille being interviewed. You know, she was on TV all the time. And Emily and I would record all of her interviews on VHS and just sit there and laugh because she was so hilarious and like talking really fast and just saying things like, whoa, we can't believe that she, we felt so free to hear her saying these things because in ACT UP, there were all these rules about, you know, P, you know PC language and how you could talk about things and what opinions you were allowed to have about feminism and, and, um, and gay life, you know, and porn and all these things, sex work. And um, so then Camille did a, gosh, I guess it was early 92 and Sex Art in American Culture came out. Yeah. And uh, I went to the lecture, I wasn't in drag, but I went up and had my book signed. And I said, oh, Camille, I love that essay that you did on Elizabeth Taylor. She's mm -hmm. you know, one of my favorite actresses. And she started writing in the book, like Butterfield Eight, Dream Vision, and and we immediately and I told her that I was doing this drag queen TV show, and so we we really clicked. And long story short, because it's kind of a long story, but it's not interesting. But she got she got a hold of my phone number from another filmmaker, and she would call me, and we hatched this idea for her to be a guest on my TV show, and I sent her. I did a video with Bruce LaBruce for the Glenda and Friends show called the Post Queer Tour, where we were reacting against queer dogma, mm -hmm. and sort of going back to pre Stonewall ideals, just to really like, we would do things to like piss off the queers that I knew from, from ACT UP and Queer Nation. So we talked on the phone a lot, Camille and I, and then we came up with, you know, all of our ideas of for Glenda and Camille to be downtown. And then in May, 1993, we filmed it. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. So it happened just like that from a book signing. Yeah. It's amazing. Huh. So, okay. So one of the things that like, that's interesting about the, the confrontations with these protesters. Um, so I think, okay, first off, when we're talking about pornography, yeah, I think there is certain ethical questions that have to be asked about the effects that it has on the actors, especially on women. Um, but the way that these protesters raise such questions, as you said, is extremely bourgeois. And as she shouts over and over again at them, is that it's, it's puritanical in the sense that it doesn't take into account, first of all, what is the nature of porn? Like, it's just like, this is horrible. We have to ban it completely. Like, there's no consideration of like 
why would anybody want to watch it in the first place? Because it, it symbolizes something about our animal nature, which you know she writes a lot about in in the first chapter of Sexual Personae. Um, and ultimately, like there's a, there's a certain metaphysical implications about it. So even if like you want to argue that it's a dangerous art form, that it's problematic, like if you deny that there's some metaphysical aesthetic charge to it, like you're denying reality. And I think that's what's interesting about this confrontation that these people can't even have a logical conversation about it because they're so blinded by their ideology. Like it's such a, it's a, it's a reality denying ideology. And as she keeps saying, it's like you're, you back down as soon as someone challenges you because you have no logic, you know? So I think what you guys do, like it exposes, you know, some, a phenomenon that really has grown to, to, you know, grown throughout the larger culture, this puritanical, um, blindly buying into ideologies without thinking about like, okay, but what are the implications of things we're talking about? Like, what's the logic behind our argument? Like, we just, we want to, this is virtue signaling. Like, we want to show we're on the right side without even thinking through our position. How do we even get to this position, you know? Yeah, I mean, the, the, it wasn't that they were even bourgeois, like I mentioned earlier, they were like left of Andrew Dworkin. Like, they were, mm -hmm. you know, like Andrew Dworkin's theory is that all, sexual intercourse is rape and on the face of it that's absurd absurd and of course you know Andrew Dworkin is an enemy of, of Camille's philosophy but I I like to look at all forms of feminism and find interesting things in it and I do kind of like that extreme statement like that all intercourse is rape like it's so extreme you know you kind of have to love it that she really you know stands behind it I don't completely understand it um but I think that's you know what in fueled these women, these women against pornography women is that um, this anti-sex attitude and that any kind of, and, and you know, they, and they're not talking about, I think they considered like gay sex, like gay men were also kind of victims of this, the patriarchy. And again, it goes beyond porn. For, for them, it was really about all sex. It wasn't just about, for them, porn was just representing, you know, sex in the real world. And um, that sex was, was bad too. Um, but you mentioned women, actresses and porn and what they have to go through. I mean, what about male coal miners? Mm. You know, like what about yeah. every job where like, yeah. would you rather be like on a set, like having sex with a hot guy or in a coal mine getting black lung disease? You know, like mm. I love how Camille talks about working class men and how they do these jobs, like men that go down into the sewer, into sewage so that bourgeois people, bourgeois women who complain about the patriarchy, oh, men are oppressing us. How many women sewer workers do you know? Have you ever met one? You're never gonna meet one because they don't exist. These men go down there, they fix the sewers, they fix you know, all these infrastructure things. They, they climb up on the sides, of, they risk their lives building buildings, these working class guys, so that you know, non-working class people can have these comfortable lives. So I like how Camille points out this, like, again, this, like, the patriarchy is evil, but all these, like, bourgeois and haute bourgeois women, they benefit from these jobs that men do that no, no woman wants to do. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's the thing that, um, again, like, you see that there's a lack of logic or, like, there's this cognitive dissonance in these positions that these kinds of I don't know, this brand of activist takes that doesn't look at the broader picture of reality. Um, but no, I mean, as you were saying before, like you're talking about with ACT UP and the kind of changes since Stonewall. So I'm curious to hear just like, I don't know, considering that we're, what, is it 50 years since Stonewall at this point? Oh God, you're really going to make me feel old. I remember when it, was I 20, when it was 20 years and mm -hmm. then when it was... The time we, keeps the, So Stonewall was 1969. And in 2019, that was the 50th anniversary, right? Oh, wow. Yeah. And I remember we did, I work at, uh, at for MoMA Design Store, and I think we did, I don't know, like some rainbow, we, we sell the rainbow flag there because it's a MoMA's collection. And my colleague, Samantha, she was like, oh, we should, you know, can you write something about the 50th anniversary of Stonewall? And I, I said, I remember when it was the 20th anniversary. <laughs> I was there in the street, you know, 
my my comrades from ACT UP destroyed a car that ran over a, 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 one of the gay protesters and almost killed him. Wow. And she looked at me like, how could you have beat, like, she didn't know how old I was then. She was like, that's impossible. How could you have been at the 20th anniversary? That was 30 years ago, but wow. yeah. Um, so 52, 53 years ago now, what has changed? I mean, obviously people aren't like chasing down cars like back then, but I don't know, what, what would you say are some of the big differences that you see in terms of activism <laughs> surrounding these issues? Um, oh gosh. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't follow gay issues as, as much as I, I mean, that was the whole point of like Bruce LaBruce and I doing the post-queer tour was that I was sort of fed up with gay politics and all the rules and I wanted to explore other ideas. And then when I left the show, when I stopped doing the videos in 1996, 97, um, I kind of just wanted to rejoin the world and not as an assimilationist. It's just mm -hmm. like, I didn't care so much about gay life. But now, I mean, it's that whole thing of not much has changed. Like there was that, I was at a party last night, we were talking about the shooting at the, in, Club Q in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And someone brought that up as like, you know, this incident of anti-gay hate, but that was like, yeah, but I heard that the person was non-binary. Yeah. You know, so it brings up these complicated issues. It's yeah. not just like the evil straight homophobe. And, you know, it's like, there's, people are going through issues and, you know, maybe this non-binary, I don't know the particulars of the case, but, mm -hmm. you know, there are people there, like, for the longest time, the gay male community was, they were, it was transphobic, it was drag phobic. You know, it was very about this cult of masculinity and, you know, working out and the whole fire island scene and bareback sex. So there's always been a lot of um, kind of horizontal hostility within the larger queer community where people, like everyone thinks it's this kumbaya thing. We're all queer, everybody loves, you know, each other. And I do see that with Generation Z, they're definitely more open and fluid and, and um, the boundaries are blurred. But in the 90s, you know, there was this type of gay man that hated drag because they thought it was um, effeminate and that they were sissies and it wasn't a good representation for the gay community. And there was a lot of worry about that. Like, don't show the drag queens and the leather man on TV because that's gonna fuel the right wing against us. And my mission with Camille was, no, we should, we, we're outlaw, you know, we're sexual outlaws. We don't need to be accepted. You know, we're living on our own terms. But yeah. we've come a long way since the yeah. 90s. There's been so much assimilation. And RuPaul's Drag Race has, to, you know, it, it's a very neoliberal approach to drag and it's totally normalized it, but it's taken the bite out of it. And it's, I have really very little interest in drag now. Mm -hmm. So I have to ask, like, considering that, as you said, like drag is, you know, it is, it's always been something outside the norm. Like it's, it's not necessarily that aims to seek acceptance by the mainstream, by neoliberal society or standards. Um, but when you say like, you know, back in the Stonewall days with ACT UP, that like you wanted to use drag, not just for performance sake, but also for political ends. Do you think that politicizing drag, politicizing, again, an art form that lies outside the norm. Do you think that compromises the nature of, of drag? Do you think that like goes against its kind of mission, if you could call it that? Or do you think it converges in some way with the political? Um, no, I think, I mean, it was political at Stonewall because the drag queens were, you know, the legend is that they started the riot, they were picking up paving stones and throwing them mm -hmm. at the police. And I just think that, that satire as a weapon is, is political. Um, and that uh, drag queens were satirizing gender roles, mm -hmm. and, you know, going back to like the 50s, the 40s. And to me, that's political. Um, now I feel like it's not about being political. It's about super normalizing it. Like, oh, we could take our five-year-old to a drag brunch in a bar and that you know we'll teach the our our four-year-olds how to tip a drag queen go-go dancer like 
it's this very and this yeah. i'm blaming kind of on millennials because they're the mm -hmm. ones like oh we have kids now and we're so oh our families are so cool you know we're queer liberals and like we you know we want our kids to grow up to be tolerant but it's kind of like i i don't completely understand this like taking your kids to a drag brunch like is that really teaching kids about same-sex relations to me drag is such um there's a lot going on it's complicated mm -hmm. and the way i discovered I think what makes gay men of, of my generation interesting is that we, we, you know, we were bullied and we were picked on and that made us strong. I'm not into this whole like, oh, we got to create safe spaces. Obviously, there's, people should not be subjected to violence. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I survived all that bullying and I think it made me who I am. And then... Um, I discovered drag in this, like I started doing like dressing up in women's clothing when I was like four or five years old because I idolized like all these women that I saw on TV, like Joanne Worley on Laughing and Cher, you know, and um, I just don't understand like bringing a drag queen into a classroom. I don't understand. I guess I need to go to one of these storybook readings to see how the kids are responding to it. But to me, it's just another level of, of clown, clowndom. Like it's a clown, which, you know, when I was in school, we had a clown come in and now they have a drag queen come in. But is that drag queen, is there something, what is the point of it? Like, what are they trying to teach the kids? Are they trying to teach them about gender roles? Are they trying to teach them that gender roles don't matter? Like, I'm not clear on what the mission is here. I'm not totally against it because yeah. I don't think it's fair unless I actually go to one of these classes and observe it yeah and i mean i think first off one of the things that camille wrote about a lot is the fact that you know going through I don't know, being bullied being given a hard time like whether we're talking about gender difference sexual difference or racism or whatever kind of prejudice it might be like sure actual violence ought to be punished because it's a crime but you know bias itself or taunting someone like it builds character and to create this this ideal of tolerance that like every single difference is totally like everything's neutral everything must be accepted or else like first of all it's again it denies reality it's, it denies that certain things are inherently different and have and that difference has a meaning but also like what does tolerance do for the for the individual person like how does that build your sense of self your sense of you know what you're striving for in your life like it really just flattens everything and i think that's what you see with drag queen story hour that like you know, drag is a, a very symbolically charged art form whether you think it's charged with something negative or positive that's up to you but like we can't pretend it's just something neutral like a clown right um, you know that's whether right. you're a fan of drag or not like to say that it's the same as a, a clown show is like it's just denying reality yeah you know? um, but the other thing i would ask though um so this is this is a critique that i read there's this a book that came out recently by Helen Andrews that's it's called Boomers and it's basically critiquing several boomer celebrities public intellectuals and she has a chapter on Camille and she's oh. you know she respects the fact that Camille's a genius and that she has you know so many incredible ideas but one of her critiques is that okay like Camille is very pro-sex very pro-porn all these things um when you kind of unleash like total sexual freedom free love this author is saying like it's kind of inevitable that you're going to get this dogmatism at some point you're going to get these this these extremists for like you know toleration and and for speech codes political correctness i am curious to hear your thoughts like having seen the beginning from stonewall up until today like do you think having free love having that kind of openness can like is that sustainable without people eventually coming in creating these kinds of the new dogmatism uh, or do you think it's it's inevitable that this was going to happen? I mean, I don't know about the dogmatism, but to Camille's credit, she does. She's not like 100% pro-sex, free love. It's amazing. It's great. It's totally positive. She talks yeah. about the 60s and how the Dionysianism of the mm -hmm. 60s went out of control, you know, and, and that um, that it led to a lot of problems. So, it, and, you know, it when things become too decadent, it's like, you know, the fall of the Roman Empire, you know, it leads to the fall of empires. So yeah. she's not this kind of like 
flower child walking around saying free love is amazing like yeah. she talks she addresses the dark side that's her whole theory about apollonianism and dionysianism and that the 60s became too dionysianist dionysianist is that a word yeah. <laughs> um so and then you know and, and camille didn't do drugs you know she yeah. she understood the whole phenomenon like why it was necessary and timothy leary and, and experiments with lsd yeah. but obviously it led to there was there was a collapse in, in morals and just in you know the 70s suddenly we were seeing that this whole utopia of sexual freedom wasn't what it was chalked up to be yeah i can look at some of camille's yeah. writings about that but for sure again she addresses the negative aspects of it as well yeah and that this is the thing where like i get tripped up because like she acknowledges that she knows that there's this there's always going to be this tension between the dionysian and the apollonian this kind of like loose flowing of, of animal nature um but also this impulse to create order to create hierarchy and structure um so like she gets that you get that but the thing is that majority of the culture is not either lacks the, in, the intelligence or the the moral self-control to say okay i'm gonna be i'm gonna let loose i'm gonna pursue all kinds of sexuality or whatever but i know that there are certain limits most people think like oh yeah dionysian free-for-all and that's it um like the, the specific example that i wonder about like when she was talking about you know women's freedom uh when she was in college like she was saying that you know girls didn't want to have these like uh, these curfews in their dorms. They didn't want all these protections from, from the bureaucracy. They wanted to say, look, like, let's be free sexually and we'll deal with the consequences. Um, so like she's not naive about the fact that there will be consequences once you let everything right. loose. Exactly. But the majority of the culture doesn't acknowledge that. They think we should be able to have total freedom. I can dress however I want and nobody should be able to do anything. People, you know. Well, yeah, that's that's a ridiculous. That is like a the people and to me that's this it's there's this whole like urban liberal like these are people that i grew up on a farm these people do not understand nature nature is closing in around us you know nature isn't like oh look at that beautiful daisy and the kitty cat no nature is you know wolves coming after your sheep in the middle of the night i grew up on a sheep farm and that's that's nature and that's what and we humans are animals so this whole idea of like and again people will say you're blaming the victim, but it's like you go jogging at four o'clock in the morning when it's dark. And because you're, you know, I got a jog before I go to my, you know, six figure job. And then you're jogging in some park and then you're, you're sexually assaulted and you're surprised. Like, obviously you should have the right to jog at 4 a.m. in a park. But that just because you feel like you should have the right doesn't mean that something terrible is not gonna happen to you. It's naive. To, well, to you can't understand. rely on a bureaucracy to like guarantee you can't expect some bureaucratic heart to guarantee that nothing's going to happen like sure if someone does it they should be punished because it's a crime exactly. exactly you can't create a world where you're there's zero risks and you have no responsibility i think that's yeah. you know logical I, to say. I mean it's i have to say like even like i've been in my building for 32 years and a long time ago i don't know it's 15 years ago there a girl uh you know a young woman on the a first floor her apartment got broken into and for some reason her id was there and the and the thief had the id and he saw that she was attractive from her photo and he came back and knocked on her door and said i have um i have your wallet i want to return it and she opened the door and he raped her wow yeah and um again i'm not blaming the victim but you just you have to be so yeah. careful it when you live in a city so we, you know, there's been such a turnover of people in this building. So there's like a whole new wave of young people. And there's a young woman, she's probably like, I don't know, 22. And she's living in that same apartment. And she'll cook with the door open in, in her underwear in the apartment. <laughs> and I'm like, um, really? Like, did you just move here from Kansas? Like, this is New York City. You can't do that. You... So I see a lot of naive behavior and just like thinking this is how the world should be and i'm going to do what i want and i expect the world around me to conform that way it's like it's, hello honey sweetheart that's not how it works nature is a dark force you know can that's camille writes about it all the time they need to go read sexual persona and all her other books 
Yeah, so no, I mean, you have, she talks about, again, in the first chapter of sexual persona, she talks about figures like Dasad, who understood that, like, once you kind of open the doors to libertinism, that again, like, there are going to be consequences, there are going to be darkness. This was Freud's point, Nietzsche understood yeah. this. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I have my questions about, like, if we, again, unleash everything, open the doors on a mass scale, considering the fact that majority of the public, especially in America, are not that intellectually capable and also morally are kind of limited. Um, I don't know, like, can we expect that it won't do mass damage? For, unless it's, I don't know, because like, again, if you're thinking about people who have that kind of awareness, who, you know, have that consciousness, sure. But on a mass level, I think, yeah, like it's, I, I feel like it's wreaked more havoc than good. I don't know. Maybe I'm too well, pessimistic. I don't really see this unleashing of Dionysian sex orgies anymore because porn is so readily available. Yeah. I think a lot of men, young men, have dropped out of the game of trying to find sex partners, yeah. specifically straight men, because it's easier to watch porn. And I haven't, I don't have the data, I don't have the studies, yeah. um, but I know from my Japanese friends that there's a phenomenon in Japan where there are men that just, they don't date. They yeah. don't have sex. They they just want to stay home and like cook for themselves, and that there's a you know there's a lower um, frequency now of of in the straight world. Again, I haven't gone out and done the research with like a clipboard, but um, I I'm not I'm not hearing that there are these huge Dionysian orgies and that there's mm -hmm. an explosion of sex clubs because the digital world has changed that so much, where you know people have sex on Zoom. You know, they have virtual sex, they have um, AI sex, you know, and um, yeah. I, to me, I think there's a lot less, a lot less like of that whole like wild letting loose Dionysian sex orgies going on. But do you think this would have, like what we're seeing now, do you think that would have happened if there weren't that first unleashing in the 60s with the sexual revolution? Well, like, it was obviously... Well, I mean, it was obviously necessary for that to happen because the 50s were so repressed and this whole, it, it was extremely important for women because, you know, this, uh, you know, the 50s was all about you had to become a housewife, you had to take care of your husband, you had to have mm -hmm. kids. And um, if it weren't for the 60s revolution, the sexual revolution was also a creative revolution. So we have all these women visionaries now women entrepreneurs and women artists and women writers and it's not just about sexual liberation mm -hmm. but sexual liberation made it necessary for women to have all these freedoms um in a, in a much larger sense mm -hmm. so whatever negative things came out of of the unleashing of like sex run rampant because you know i mean joan didion chronicled it and and slouching towards gomorrah is that mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. uh, she went to the hey, Ashbury and, you know, people who are younger idealize, oh, flout, the people are getting stoned and having sex. There was a lot of rape going on. There were a lot of women being taken advantage of. Um, so even while it was happening, you know, obviously there was a lot of darkness going on. But again, the big picture is we needed that breaking out of, um, the, of the family unit and of conventional sex roles. So the positives outweigh the negatives, I think. Yeah, and I think no matter where you, where your, what your opinions are on this question, I think like what's most interesting to me about people like Camille and the, the, the kind of work that she did is like, it raises these questions about, yeah, like the metaphysical, the aesthetic implications of what's happening, um, which I think gets largely overlooked by either political or kind of moralistic agendas concerns um because like if we can't go deeper and understand like what what are those deeper implications of things happening in our culture of course there's going to be a culture war of course there's going to be a clash because there's no foundation for which we can have these conversations and think through what's going on um especially and we see that like with what you're saying about the 50s and the post-war culture that like this super bourgeois worldview became totally flat like there was no depth anymore so like again i i, I agree that like of course there's going to be a reaction to that and whether the consequences are for better or worse, like, can we be surprised that people reacted to that flattening? No, because it's just, it's boring. Nobody wants that. Um, mm -hmm. 
But no, going back to the younger generation. So as we were saying, like, you know, with your videos being available online and also like with Camille's work resurfacing amongst younger people, why, why do you think that your stuff is resonating with the younger generation? Like what, what do you think younger people see in this kind of discourse that's lacking in the mainstream right now? Well, I think that young people are fed up with all the rules that, um, you know, the, it's, it's almost a cliche to say this, but the so-called culture of wokeness Mm -hmm. and like how you can talk about things and um you have to be careful how you know what terms you use and and i think a lot of young people they're young and they want to go out and explore the world and they want to talk about things freely without being um censured or censored mm -hmm. and they i am kind of amazed that they discovered camille and i'm glad that they did but they see and you know she's obviously not the only one where they're like wow we can be free thinkers so it's really this movement of free thinking. Like we want to be able to express ourselves and our opinions without being attacked and canceled. You know, we want it. And, and that's this whole, my friend, Ben, he's, he's Gen Z and he explains these things to me, like hanging out in these so-called dime square places. And, <laughs> and it's like, you go, and I, I've only been to like one or two of those parties, but it's, you walk in the door and it's all about no one's going to attack you because you said the wrong thing mm -hmm. it's like anything goes and it's and it's great it's not like anything goes let's go get fisted in the bathroom like there, it's not like a sex party it's it's this it's this like ideological orgy mm -hmm. where or, or this uh, orgy of ideas where there are no wrong opinions and a lot of ugliness comes out of it because there are people that feel free to be racist and say racist things but you know that's on them and it's like attacking someone and censoring them is not going to change them. Yeah. They're still going to be these horrid racists and they're going to find another outlet for, for their behavior. Um, but I just think young people, they find Camille refreshing because maybe she's giving them permission to be free thinkers and not be weighed down by all these rules that were created by what is supposedly this woke culture. Yeah, and I, I think what's interesting is that this uh, her kind of discourse, her ideas, are appealing to people on an array of like uh, you know different levels of the ideological spectrum. Like you have more artistic, more kind of I don't want to say liberal, but like more I don't know free thinkers. You have people who are lean a little bit more conservative. But again, the point is like she's digging deeper into the culture, asking questions that I don't think anyone's people are too afraid to ask right now so again yep. no matter whether you agree with the the conclusions or not like there's something so attractive about the logic the, the depth of the logic there um and i don't know i mean i think the biggest thing is that with the woke thing is that there's this moralistic obsession um and this fear that like if i don't prove that i'm on the right side that i'm i'm saved quote unquote then like i'm gonna be destroyed i'm gonna be canceled but like yeah do I actually understand these quote unquote right positions? Like, is there a real uh, sense of rationality behind them? Or am I just following the group? What, what are what I, the group wants me to think? Um, you know, so yeah, I think like if you starve the people of logic and reason for that long, then there's gonna be a reaction inevitably to that. Right? Well, I also think it's because Camille is funny. Well, that's and, and I, I think that's a big part of it. Um, like. I think that Gen Z probably has a better sense of humor than mm -hmm. millennials. And I'm so glad that millennials are like fading, like are yeah. the squares now because they really were a drag. And, you know, for the longest time, you, for someone my age to criticize millennials, it was considered like get off my lawn talk. But now because we have this flourishing young culture of, of Gen Z who are so open to things, um, now it's time to look back at the millennials and be like, wow, they were really square. And they're the ones that are like pushing around their baby carriages and having their conventional lifestyles. And they really weren't um, very radical, you know? Yeah. They, they really, yeah. deep down, that whole hipster thing was about being deep, like foodie culture. It's deeply bourgeois. Like you're obsessed with food in the 80s and 90s, like in the East Village. Food was when we would have like a slice of pizza every other day, you know, and like you were concerned about whether you were going to get drink tickets at the Pyramid Club. It wasn't about, oh, did you have that new artisanal cornbread? You know, like 
nobody talked about food in 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 the 80s when i started going out to clubs here in, in the east village yeah. it was who cared and then suddenly this millennial generation they're they're obsessed you know with going to the you know the restaurants and and scanning the menus and the ingredients and like and that's why i think like this whole dionysian sex and drug thing is not happening anymore because they're more obsessed with like you know, a, an artisanal corn muffin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think the fact that you said like people like her because she's funny, like that's, I feel like, you know, she was super inspired by Oscar Wilde and that's his genius that in when culture becomes so obsessed with these moralisms, this puritanical mindset, like you need someone with a sense of humor, with a real aesthetic sensibility to kind of shake that up because, you know, without aesthetics, without something being funny, entertaining, like, what are we doing? Like ethics without aesthetics is, it's nothing. It has no value, you know, but, you know, but speaking about the food and all the millennial stuff, let's talk a little bit about New York, how it's changed since, you know, back in those days, like, I don't know, what, what are some of the things you noticed? Like, is, like, let's, if we start with downtown Greenwich Village, West Village area, where you, where you filmed that episode, what, what do you notice there now? Oh God. Well, I mean, it's completely been, um, the, the fascism of Sarah Jessica Parker has completely, you know, transformed what was once like this, you would see leather men walking down the street, you know, you would, you couldn't walk two blocks without finding a gay guy to hook up with, like there, there was this freedom and like, um, you know, it was wild and there were cheap rents and, and then it, it, sex in the city is obviously not the only thing that led to the demise of that mm -hmm. wild bohemianism, but it was definitely a big, you know, turning point. And it inspired all these very square people to move to New York. And they created this fantasy of what they thought New York should be on that TV show. And they even recruited people from, from my world of, 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 of the bohemian, downtown bohemianism, Pat Fields, like Pat for the longest time, Patricia Field was the godmother of the drag scene. You know, we all, we loved her. We, we all shopped in her stores and she was a subcultural figure. And then good for her. She got that job at, on Sex in the City. And I interviewed her for Dutch Magazine. And, and I was very happy for her that, you know, because she went through a period where she wasn't sure if she was gonna be able to keep her stores open and pay the rent. So that show really saved her financially. And unfortunately mm -hmm. that's the rules of, of capitalism but that the whole sex in the city phenomenon really it, it, it turned the, the west village into being this bohemia, bohemia into this bourgeois women going out and having cocktails and talking about and again it was like focused on getting married and all these conventional ideas and values that people thought were radical oh they're talking about sex women are talking about sex on tv Oh my goodness, but it was all leading up to like the marriage, the Mr. Big, you know, yeah. the wedding gown, you know, and, and it drove up the rents. And now it's like, you can't afford to live over there unless, you know, you have this high paying job and, and a lot, many, so many gay places closed. Um, so, I mean, I, you know, I, I go, I, I dine at this restaurant called Jeans. I don't know if you know about it. It's on West mm, 11th yeah. street. It's been there for a hundred years. And it's, they serve continental cuisine. So they have like, you know, Italian American food, but they also have French food like Vichyssoise. And they bring you a relish plate with, with, with carrots and, and radishes. And it's very, it's very like 1950s food. <laughs> and it maintains that like old feeling of the West Village, but it's where Sarah Jessica Parker lives across the street. And to her credit, she did save that. I'm gonna say something nice about her during the pandemic there were bike racks in front of the restaurant so they couldn't build an outdoor dining yeah. shed so they almost went out of business and she used her power for, she used her power for good for a change and like got you know rid of the bike racks so they could serve during the pandemic oh, good for her um, All right. but there are these vestiges i guess my point is of mm -hmm. of old old school new york little pockets of it that still exist on the west side but not much you know the, the West Piers, the West Side Piers, where Camille and I go and talk about gay men having sex on the on the piers, the rotting piers. Now it looks like North Korea over there. It looks like Pyongyang. You know, it's just like this cement, you know, authoritarian, authoritarian, you know, architecture. Like everything's cement, and there's no sex going on here. And 
yeah, it's really become yeah. sanitized. The um, one good thing I'll say about West Village, I think it has a decent music, like live music scene. Like you have mm-hmm. several jazz clubs, soul clubs, mm-hmm. all, you know, I don't know. I've gone to a couple of them. It's been a while, but That's other good. than that, I don't know. It's not that much going on. That's good. Yeah. What, what are some of the jazz clubs that you go to? Um, so Blue Note is mm-hmm. on West Third. That famous, been there for decades. Yeah, Blue Note's still there. Village Underground, The Groove. That's all, yeah, that's all West Third. And then mm. they closed the Fat Cat mm. during the pandemic. I know right. a lot of NYU kids went there because it was 18 and up. Um, now it's, I mean, it's, it's still a jazz club. It's another name, but... Where is Smalls? Is is it in the West Village? I forget. I haven't been there in years. Do you know Smalls? I don't know. No. Yeah, that's one of the that's one of the more upscale jazz clubs. But no, but there's there's still a live music scene. Um, the restaurants, as you said, like they've gotten pretty bougie. There are there, a couple good places here and there, but yeah. Yeah, that's why we only go to Jeans because it's yeah. like very old school. I'm gonna have to try it. And Monty's on McDougal Street is Monty's. great. That's that's been there for for decades. It's, old school mm. Italian restaurant, very good food. What but yeah, about, it's all these. Hmm? I was going to ask, what about Cafe Reggio's? Do you have? Oh, that was one there? of Camille's favorites. When, it was, when, okay. Yeah. I'm um, not surprised. It's still there. I go there so, sometimes with my friend Dana. We really like it. They've changed over the pandemic, at least they've changed. Yeah. I've, yeah, I've noticed because the way the, the crowd that's coming in, but also just the dynamic with the waiters is different. It's oh. less it's less spontaneous, less lively. Yeah. But I mean, but that's downtown in general. Like after COVID, things are eh, weird. But I love Reggio's anyway. I love the art. I love most of the pastries. <laughs> but. Well, the other thing is this whole new restaurant scene. Like the whole idea of like going out to dinner is you want to hold court. Like our favorite restaurant was El Quixote, which in the Chelsea Hotel, which mm-hmm. the new one is nothing like the old one. So don't even bother going. But like you would go there and have dinner. And they wouldn't rush you out. They would let you sit there and talk. That's what, yeah. that's Not the sure. European yes. style of going out to dinner, you know? Yeah. And like, it's like when you go to a restaurant in Paris or Berlin, you have to beg them to bring you the check. You know, they yeah. won't let you sit there for five yeah. hours. But this new restaurant scene, they, they actually tell you when you walk in, instead of like saying, welcome, hello, like you give your name and they go, all right, you've got 90 minutes. <laughs> From when you sit, your ass hits the chair, you've got 90 minutes to order and eat and then you got to be out of here because we got another you know group coming in and it's all it's like wow i'm, I'm paying these inflated prices yeah and yeah. you're europe, rushing you're me never out gonna get that. no and um, there's also no that, customer service in europe but i don't think that's a bad thing per se yeah it's, you know so what that's what about it out. yeah and I was going to ask, what about Washington Square Park? Thoughts I was going to, yeah, about? I was thinking about yeah. that because I walk through it all the time. Actually, to, to get to Jeans, I walk through Washington Square Park. And you still, it's kind of heartening to see these young people like playing the guitar or yeah. like the woman that used to like schlep a piano in there and then mm-hmm. like skateboarders. Like I saw this group of skateboarders and I was like, oh God, because they were doing like these very choreographed moves and uh, moves and I thought oh they must be filming it for a TikTok video and <laughs> and I looked and I didn't see it, it didn't look like anybody was filming it and I was like they're just doing it like we used to do you know just do it to like do it in the moment not to have like a TikTok following yeah um so you still feel you know that the young people they they've read about what New York was like and mm-hmm. 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, the 90s, were, con- which is like, I like to represent the 90s and just keep it going historically because that's considered like a golden period in, in New York mm-hmm. and nightlife. And so that's why I have a lot of faith in Gen Z is that mm-hmm. they seem to be more interested in, I'll give, you, I'll give you an example of when I noticed the shift. So I've been in this building for 32 years mm-hmm. wow. and then 90s, I was a celebrity and then the 2000s, you know, it was, I was getting recognized less. And um, I guess by the mid 2000s, like my fame had kind of dwindled and I, and there was people moving into my building and they were the the young millennials then. And they, it was like, I was invisible. They Mm. wouldn't say hello to me. They wouldn't hold the door open for me. Mm. Um, Really unfriendly. 
And this went on and I just thought, oh God, I'm just gonna keep getting older and older and I'm gonna be surrounded by these young people that don't even see me. And now the millennials, they've all moved out to the suburbs because they have five kids. Yeah. And my building is filled with all Gen Z's and they're, they all wanna know, like they hold the door open for me. They ask me like, what apartment do you live in? And they introduce themselves and yeah. like, yeah, they talk to That's me. Cool. And, yeah, and because yeah. that was a, a lot of people of my age, like Jeremiah, who does Vanishing New York, he would always complain about the people in his building that were just, he was invisible to them and that they were rude and cold. And, I, you know, I, I hate to break it into like millennial versus Gen Z, but I really think it was this millennial attitude. Mm -hmm. And that because they're grown up now and they're having their grown up family lives, they're, um, they're in the back seat now. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Um, one more question. Do you have any hot takes on the crime wave going on in New York right now? That's a hot uh, issue. Well, yeah, it's, it's awful. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I like the police and um, I, I understand that there are bad policemen, but I never was, I wasn't involved in this whole defund the police movement. And I'm relieved that there are more police on the subway. Um, and I think the crime wave is, is um, a result of the collapse that happened during the pandemic. Yeah. And it was like people like me who were, were able to work from home and you know we have nice jobs, but then there were all those people that were already like living on the edge before mm -hmm. the pandemic and the pandemic just pushed them over the edge. And it was a lot of people and also just mentally ill people that were sort of keeping it together. And I think the pandemic just really broke a lot of people. So I think that's contributed to the crime. And also maybe it's not always crime. It maybe it's, it's mentally ill mm -hmm. people behavior where they're pushing people in front of the subway, they're stabbing people. And, um, you know, I, I I think I think it's obvious that the pandemic has has created this surge in crime, yeah. um, and uh, I mean I'm going to ride the subway tonight, and we'll see how that goes. But I do I do feel safer. Some of my friends are like, oh, you watch the news too much. It hasn't really gotten worse, but it's it's gotten worse. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I it's been a while since I've really been living in Manhattan, but at least while I was there, I never saw any violent i never saw any crimes at all barely ever heard of them but especially like this like i understand if you steal someone's phone like all right or someone's wallet that makes sense but like randomly pushing someone slashing them punching them and then you steal nothing like that's i mean that's a sign that something's really up yeah um, it, it's almost normal. like this wave washed across people and, and anyone who was like even slightly mentally ill it amplified it yeah and um yeah hmm. Yeah, it's the, the whole like people getting punched in the head randomly on the street, like it's terrifying. That's for what? You know, but, yeah. uh, but the fact that you said before that like with Gen Z, you're seeing, I don't know, they're a little bit more personable that they open the door for you. They, they're more communicative. I think a lot, not a lot, at least some of this, uh, the issues with mental health and whatnot, at least, or even just people feeling isolated and alone. If there were some sense of community, some sense of us being accountable for each other, like I think it would mitigate to some extent some of the issues that we're seeing. So, like, I don't know, if there are younger people who are more open, they're paying attention to their neighbors. Like, I don't know, it gives me a little bit of hope. Cause again, like if you feel totally alone and isolated, like I understand why you go crazy and do something like that. But right. Yeah. You know, but anyway, so before we go, Glenn, anything you want to plug for listeners? Oh, well, um, gee, the, I, I have, right, well, right now, so I had a very successful screening at the Museum of the Moving Image two weeks ago. It's this wonderful, have you ever been there? It's in, it's in Queens. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and <clears throat> it was um, two, two Glenda videos and work um, by this filmmaker from Portland, Oregon, Vanessa Renwick. Okay. And we had a really great discussion afterwards. So uh, Vanessa and I are trying to think of ways where we can maybe like take it on tour or have it screened in other venues around, <clears throat> around the country. Um, mm -hmm. So we're kind of maybe working on that and my distributor is thinking of some ideas. I'm having a screening in Miami in February, um, but it's a private screening for VIPs. Um, but it's for, it's for this like high level museum membership of this LGBTQ plus group. Um, 
and they're flying me and my friend Ben. Ben's going to moderate the discussion, so they're flying us down to Miami. So that's exciting, but I can't really plug it because it's invite only. Um, and then next year I'll be in this big exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum. Oh wow! Okay. Which is going it's about zines. Nice. Um, yeah, and that's going to be super amazing. Bruce the Bruce is in it, and um, just about anybody who did a zine in the '90s, I think, will be in the show. And there's and it's multimedia. It's like artists who did other types of work besides zines. So they're showing one of my videos. But I, I did a zine called Pussy Grazer with my friend Emily, the one who was sitting with me when we decided we should start reading Camille Paglia. Oh, wow. Um, so that will be in the show. So, um, but hopefully before that, there'll be some more screenings. Yeah. Well, Tell well, everyone so should much. follow me on Instagram if yes, they want yes. to, uh, updates. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, and I'll include your Instagram handle for people to follow. But no, but then this was great. Thank you for coming on. Yeah. Thanks for having me. When,